and welcome to the Enter the Bible podcast, where you can get answers or at least reflections on everything you wanted to know about the Bible, but were afraid to ask. I am Katie Langston. And I'm Catherine Schipperdecker. And we have, again, as our special guest, our dear friend and colleague, Professor Lois Malcolm. She's Professor of Systematic Theology at Luther Seminary, where we all work. So, Lois, thank you again for coming uh, to join us for uh, another episode of this podcast. It's great to it's have you. It's a delight to be here. Good, good, good. Always good to have you. Uh, so our uh, question today was submitted by a, a listener. Uh, and as as usual, you, uh, if you have a question that you would like us to address, go to enterthebible.org uh, and submit it. We can't get to all of the questions, but we try to uh, get to as many as we can. So the, the short version of this question is, is there a difference between human and satanic evil? Uh, and the, the, the question, that's how we're kind of summarizing it. Uh, but the, the longer form of the question that was submitted was having experienced both the worst and best of humanity and knowing that both human and satanic evil exist, is it important to distinguish between them or is evil just evil with the difference being only in depth or intensity. So, uh, Lois, we give you the hard questions so, <laughs> because we love you and we know you have good answers. <laughs> so, is there is it important to do, is there a difference and is it important to uh, to make that distinction between human and demonic or satanic evil? First of all, I. I think I think that we can make the distinction, and that it is important to make the distinction. Um, I would say that one of the problems with, um, especially American, a, a mainline Protestantism, um, is that we have forgotten the force and power of demonic power and satanic power, mm. and that yeah. we reduce everything simply to the consequences of human action. Mm -hmm. And so we don't recognize that there are, in fact, spiritual forces at work. Um, this has been a central theme in the biblical tradition, which is that there are angelic and satanic forces at work. There are spiritual powers, however we want to define that, however we want to understand that. And um, we are deceiving ourselves when we don't recognize that. So, yes, mm -hmm. I think we mm -hmm. do need to make a distinction. On the other hand, I don't think we should dwell on, if we are going to talk about satanic forces, what we need to emphasize is the fact that the cross of Christ overcomes all powers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. spiritual mm -hmm. and human, in the sense that all have mm -hmm. died in the cross. Mm -hmm. um, as as um, Luther's, uh, Luther's great hymn, um, a mighty fortress is our God. There's that quotation, a little word shall fell, shall fell them, all of the demonic mm -hmm. powers. And that little mm -hmm. word is the word of the cross. Yeah. So we have nothing to fear. On the other hand, we do need to recognize what kinds of forces we're up against. Mm -hmm. And I, I could go on, but push back or well, tell me where to go from here. Yeah. No, no, I think, I think you're exactly right, Lois. And I think, uh, uh you mentioned American Christians. I think that's certainly true uh, for all Western Christians. I think European and American Christians tend not to, uh, and obviously this is an overgeneralization. There are certainly American Christians who who take, uh, you know, demonic or satanic evil seriously. But mainline Protestant, um, many Catholic, uh, well, it, it, I would say the majority of American Christians don't talk about it that much. You grew up, Lois, you grew up as the child of missionaries in the Philippines. Uh, I uh, uh, don't have that experience, but I have spent a significant amount of time in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And I think in both of those contexts, particularly, you know, and, and across the global South, generally speaking, Christians are more attuned to or aware of or willing to acknowledge uh, the presence of evil as a, a force, as a spiritual force, you know, demonic or satanic, however you want to define that. I think uh, maybe maybe to the other extreme, right? Maybe attributing too much to, right. to that. I, I remember right. I was teaching a class in Ethiopia and uh, some of my students uh, were talking about a, um, 
a woman they knew uh, who uh, was acting very strangely. She was the wife of an evangelist, right? a, a Christian woman, uh, and she she was just acting very strangely. And so people came and you know prayed over her and, and were going to cast out a demon. And then they realized that she hadn't eaten for a week, right? The, this, the, the evangelist right. was paid... The evangelist was paid so little. I mean, that's another matter, right? right? That right. injustice that she, you know, her her acting at was not demons. It was a physical reaction to to you know hunger or or starvation, really. Yeah. Uh, and so they they were like, you know, you, you just have to discern, right? You can't attribute everything to demonic forces, but you have to be aware that they are, uh, you know, that that their presence right. is real. So. In fact, I would say the wrong, <laughs> the wrong people often address the wrong issue. I mean, for example, yeah, sure. I think a lot of American Christians want to explain everything in terms that are empirical, or they want to explain mm-hmm. everything in terms of the consequences of human actions. Mm-hmm. And so they are unprepared mm-hmm. as a society for dealing with forces that go beyond right. merely human actions or the right. ways in which human actions can take on like movements in a society at large can take on a, mm-hmm. an mm-hmm. evil force. So, so we're mm-hmm. unprepared for that. On the other hand, and even in American society, there are a lot of people who see demons all around the place. And then also who call other people demonic, do you know what I mean? Right. In, in, right, right, in right. false and inappropriate ways. So it, it, it seems like the wrong people hear the wrong message. The people who need to be aware of demonic powers are are tuned out and the people who need to start looking for as you as you pointed out in your story Catherine other reasons for the behavior um need they need to be more aware of you know that there are very there's a very we live in a very real empirical world that has consequences Mm -hmm. for Mm -hmm. for actions yeah let me let me ask a question Lois so um so what would you say is the difference between like what is human evil? If we if we understand that demonic evil is like or satanic evil is, you know, to your point, we don't I in fact when I get questions like this from um prisoners, um I'll I'll often, you know, try to answer it briefly, but then I'll say, you know, we probably shouldn't spend a lot of time right. trying to like map the mm. precise metaphysics of right. the of the demonic. Right. Let's you know, let's focus on Christ, right? But but right. understanding that we do acknowledge the the reality and existence of forces um, and entities that are opposed to God. Um, what 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 is so? And that would be we would call satanic or demonic evil. What is human evil, and how is it distinct from those things? First of all, the the where where our idea of Satan comes from is the sort of the classical understanding of this is that Satan is a fallen angel. Mm, that right. Satan was, and an angel simply is not, not divine, but, but a power that is not human, that transcends human powers, but does have, is a kind of spiritual force in the world. So the uh-huh. satanic is a spiritual force for evil as opposed to a spiritual force for good. So just to to Mm -hmm. clarify, now the distinction with with human beings is that we as human beings have bodies, and which means that we are subject to time and space. And so where our evil comes in is the evil that that is a result of our intentional choices, our intentional moral choices that are very much connected with how we conduct ourselves in time and space. Whereas a spiritual force is a force in a sense that transcends that time and space and that sort of, um, yeah, the time and space consequences of action. So what makes it human is that what makes human evil, it's moral and if you want to think about what's moral or not moral, just think of the Ten Commandments, mm-hmm. okay, in terms of how do you treat other people, for example? Do you do you treat other people with justice? So anything that is unjust or that violates the trust that we have for one another is evil and has consequences. Mm-hmm. Now, where the demonic can tie in with our human evil mm-hmm. is that often when we give ourselves over to the choices that we've to bad choices so to speak to right. to 
the negative consequences of our action, we can get so caught up that in a sense, we open a space for these, for the negative, the evil forces to take over, mm-hmm. which often happens both on a personal level, but also on a societal level. Yeah. For example, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in capitalist economies, for example, where everybody is measured by their performance by how successful you are, by wisdom, by human wisdom, wealth, Mm -hmm. and power. Mm -hmm. Well, if you evaluate people on the basis of whether they are wealthy or powerful and do not recognize that other people and yourself is made in God's image and therefore deserving of love and respect, Mm -hmm. when we give ourselves over to, again, to to simply power and wealth as being the criteria by which we judge and make choices, we literally do open ourselves up as a society to forces that can, that can take over. That's, that's a sobering uh, statement, but it's very sobering because I I think we pay those consequences. I think we're paying those. Now it's very, it's very difficult to now say, okay, here's the demon, you know, here's the person who's been, I don't think it's for us to, to be pinpointing and looking for demons behind. But um, this was Paul Tillich's argument about Nazi socialism in, um, in Germany during the 1930s that because the the Protestant church, the, the Lutheran church had lost its capacity to speak, especially to wor- the working classes, especially young working class males, there was a spiritual vacuum. Yeah. And because of that spiritual vacuum, they needed something to give them a sense of dignity and purpose. And that's why yeah. they turned to na- Nazi socialism, which yeah. ended up having a kind of demonic power. In yeah, fact, sure, Tillich yeah. has a very nice definition of how, how do you know whether it's demonic or not? You know, a spiritual power is this creative, this power for create for creating life and or death. Do you know what I mean? That yeah. spiritual power mm-hmm. brings about life or death. It's demonic when that creative power is not aligned with goodness and justice. You mm-hmm. see, God's power is always both merciful and just. It's always yeah. powerful, but it's always just. And it, demonic spiritual power becomes demonic when it simply has the force, but it has no. But it's not based on the criteria of justice. So that wealth and power really are the criteria. What is going to generate more right. mm-hmm. wealth and what is going to enable me to have power over other people? That that can then, when when we commit ourselves to those values, um, we allow we open ourselves up to to forces that um, that captivate us, and that can happen on a personal level too. Yeah, um, yeah. I know in my own life, I don't want to say that I was demon possessed, sure. but I know that I, I was opening myself up to forces beyond merely the consequences of the, either my, my actions or other people's actions, which, which bred a kind of resentment and anger that I, that I was gripped in, that I had to, mm-hmm. in a sense, be released from. Right. And That's why how, do you, how, how are you released from that? This is where we need one another as community. My my former colleague Jan Ramsey, you know you knew Jan yes, Ramsey. Yes, I know Jan. Yeah, she and I. She was a pastoral care prof at Luther Seminary, and she and I taught a course together on forgiveness. Mm-hmm. But we wanted to do the work on each other, and she spent a lot of time helping me work through much of my anger and resentment because she saw, I mean, she could analyze it uh, on a psychological level, but I think there really was a spiritual factor that I needed to be released from. And so forgiveness forgiveness is one of the keys to the keys and declaring that the, when we declare forgiveness, we're not right. letting people off the hook. Right. <laughs> forgiveness we're is the declaration people. of God's power that you have been freed right. from the power of sin and death and demonic forces. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You, you are yeah. freed yeah, from yeah. everything that holds you back. And we need to declare that to one yes. another, both in church and outside of church. Right. Do you know what I mean? We, we need to be reminded that God's power is greater than all the other powers that grip us. Yeah, That's so, so important, Lois. Thank you for bringing that up. And that power of forgiveness is power not just for the person forgiven, but also for the one doing the forgiving, right? Not 
not allowing that anger or that resentment or that guilt mm-hmm. maybe or or mm-hmm. uh, a shame to to control you but to mm-hmm. to right. to announce to pronounce that word of forgiveness uh, right. in and for the sake of Christ to release yeah. to release you from that i i want to so i'm I, I think you're exactly right, Lois, and your your example of Nazism is important. Unfortunately, we still see neo-Nazis uh, today, you know, going back to that. Uh, we see other movements. I, w- I want to point out a contemporary movement at the risk of being uh, too political, but the obsession we have in the United States with guns, with firearms, and the, the real kind of death um you know, uh, uh, fascination with death. Now, I, mm-hmm. I, I am all for hunting. I, I, you know, have served a lot and can't come from a small town. You know, if you want to have a gun to hunt deer, go for it. If you want a handgun for protection, that's your choice. What I, what I, uh, I think, you know, with all the mass shootings we've seen, particularly in schools, you know, what a heart wrenching thing. Uh, the proliferation of, of guns in cities. Uh, we've had just a, a few, a couple weeks ago in Minneapolis, two different weekends, uh, guns were used and people died. And, you know, that, uh, that, that idolization of firearms or guns to the exclusion of care for children and, you know, other innocents who are being killed by them. Uh, I just think that's, I, I do think that's demonic uh, and and idolatry. Now, I'm sure there are listeners who will disagree with me, and I uh, I I honor you, I respect you, but uh, I just think there are examples all around us of forces that 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 work with human evil, but amplify it uh, amplify it to a degree where death is yeah where there's a kind of cult of death uh, that results. And I just I want to follow up with Tillich's insight about Nazi so, not Nazi socialism in Germany, because his challenge was really a challenge to the German Christians of the time, which I think is a challenge we face um, as Christians, for example, in the United States. And that is that when we are not actively engaged in caring for the young and teaching the young Mm. in our midst about Mm -hmm. what it means to live in the faith, when we are not actively engaged in building institutions, colleges, seminaries, churches, et cetera, that actually can be places where faith is formed Mm -hmm. and where identity is shaped around values and justice and mercy, that's Mm -hmm. when we do open ourselves to this cult of death, which you're describing, Catherine. And it doesn't matter whether you're a liberal or a conservative. This is not about what your politics is, but it is about how do we as Christian communities shape one another. It's so that the focus is not on there are demons around the corner. The focus is how do we fill that spiritual vacuum so that we don't open ourselves up to these other forces that quickly come in yeah. to yeah, give yeah, yeah. people an identity that is right. other than Jesus. Right, right. I think it's what you said about sort of um, the animating force. Lois is really interesting to me. And just remembering that like those animating powers or whatever you can discern them um based on like what is behind them and Mm. you know if it doesn't take the shape of the cross right of self (laughs) right self-giving um care and uh, and love then you're probably dealing with a different kind of force Exactly. And you probably don't want to mm-hmm. mess with that. Right. And um yeah, and I think we see all around us, you know, places where the animating force is, is not um the self giving and love of the cross. So Right, right. And God's justice and mercy life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and in some yeah. ways. Yeah. So, right. I, I always tell my students, you can avoid politics, just teach scripture. Right. And yeah. quite frankly, there are pretty explicit things. Most right. of scripture, we can argue about a lot in scripture, but most of scripture is actually pretty explicit. It's right. about yeah. life, not death. Do you know what I mean? Right. It's about justice, right, right, not right. injustice. Right. right. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'll, I'll just say, since I brought up the, you know, the, the gun issue that it, there are demonic, there are forces, uh, death dealing forces on the left as well. Uh, Absolutely. and, and but all, all of us, right? all, all of us, uh, are, uh, yeah, all of us are, um, uh, sinful right? uh, on left and right. And, uh, and if your theology looks too much like one or the other, like the left or the right, then you better re-examine your theology because we all fall prey to sin. So, uh, but uh, the, the last word really, I think is what you've already said, Lois, right? That uh, uh, we, we, we need to acknowledge these forces, right? We need right. to know they exist, but we can't be so fascinated with them and see them under, you know, under every stone every and we right. need to proclaim always that they do, they are not uh, as powerful as Christ, right? That they are yeah, defeated, exactly. defeated already in the cross. Right. Uh, right. So they still have power, but they don't have ultimate power. Uh, yeah. And that, and that uh, we, we are safe. Uh, we are saved. We are, uh, we are held uh, in God's love through the power of the Holy and- Spirit. And paradoxically, it is God's self-sacrificial love demonstrated on the cross that overcomes these powers. That, right. that, right. That's why I love Luther's Beautiful. line, one little word shall fell them. Right. Yeah. That it's not yeah, about yeah, yeah. a more powerful power. It's, it's literally the power of the cross, as you were yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. that is Beautiful. Well, thank you so much. Uh, again, another another conversation we could continue to have for a long time, but um, there's, um, you know, there's only so much time. So thank you, <laughs> Lois, for being with us yes, today. Yes, thank you, Lois. I uh, really appreciate that. And thank you to our listeners and viewers for joining us on this episode of the Enter the Bible podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please do a couple of things we would ask you very nicely. One, go to um, your uh, to Apple or to one of your favorite podcast apps and rate and review the podcast. That really helps other people learn about it uh, or like and subscribe uh, to our channel. Uh, and uh, head over to enterthebible.org for more great resources, um, conversations like this, videos, courses, all kinds of cool things over there. Uh, and of course, the most uh, wonderful compliment you can pay us is to share this episode with a friend. So thanks so much for doing that. And uh, we'll see you next time.